Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a Cabal interview with Dim Shagaya. My name is Tomiwa Aladikoma, and I'm the CEO of Big Cabal Media, which is the parent company for Tech Cabal and Zigogo. Today, we're going to be uh, interviewing one of the most experienced founders, investors, and entrepreneurs on the continent. Sim is just being set up and he will be with us in one moment. We wait for him. I'm going to talk through sort of the way this session is going to work. I am going to start by interviewing Sim. So I'll take him through a series of questions that I have and that the Tech About team has put together. Then once we're done with that, we will start to take some crowdsourced questions and some questions from the Q&A. So some people have already sent their questions in ahead of time and we'll ask some of those, but we'll also be asking some questions in the Q&A. Thank you all very much for joining us for this. Welcome, Sim. I am Thanks, going to... Tommy. All right. So I'm going to start a bit broadly. Instead of diving directly into crisis mode, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the state of the African tech ecosystem. Um, you can focus on Nigeria, but you can talk about the entire continent. Just coming into this crisis, December 2019, January 2020, how would you say we were doing? Where were we as a continent, as a tech ecosystem? <laughs> Well, if you take if you take a long term view, I think we're doing exceptionally well. I, I think we're still doing okay, and I guess we'll talk about what the impact of this crisis is on on um, on the crisis uh, on on tech a bit more. But I think we're doing really really well. We're seeing a range of sort of new founders that are much more savvy to the needs of the environment and business models that make sense in the context of the of the African environment. I think sort of from, you know, the late 2000s through the early teens, there were sort of a, a lot of uh, features that were kind of anomalies. So let, let's sort of take them one piece at a time. Sort of from the founder point of view, there was a big sort of push to over replicate models that had done well in other geographies. I think um, the West especially. Uh, and while a large part of innovation does involve sort of watching what's happening in other regions and then trying to localize those models, I think the entrepreneurs we're seeing now are much more savvy to what works on the African continent. And we're even starting to see sort of more original um, business, business models. Um, there are very exciting businesses that have made it from seed stage through sort of series A and series B. I think FinTech has done especially well and we can talk about whether consolidation is going to come to that sector or not sort of as time goes by. But I think fintech has done really, really well. I think um, ride hailing, especially sort of before the regulatory challenges that it met, had shown quite a bit of momentum. And I think the story is not sort of done on that. And then less so education and healthcare. And even e-commerce, I think we mm -hmm. had come pretty far um, in, in the sense that, um, you know, we have... You know, there are a thousand flowers blooming on Instagram. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs are using sort of social media and alternative channels to do e-commerce. And to my understanding, like Gigi is doing incredibly well. So I think we've come pretty well from the founder side. From the investor side, I think we've come really far also. So, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't have uh, investors that were focused on sort of the early stage of the investment life cycle. And that was a major problem. So what you saw is that classically later stage investors like Naspers or Shinivik and some of these bigger guys doing early stage funding. And that creates all kinds of um, strange behavior and dynamics um, that um, are not particularly great. But now you're seeing a range of really savvy um, local institutions or locally focused institu institutions in the seed stage and the series A stage and are able to sort of um, nurture these early stage businesses through to maturity. Um, of course, there's TLCom, which have invested in ULESSON, um, and I've been really impressed with how savvy um, they are. And um, the nature of our working relationship has been unlike any other relationship I've enjoyed with an investor and anything I'd done previous to this. The level of empathy, the yeah, yeah, the 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 advice and the the conversations that come from um, an early stage fund I find are I'm very, very different from, say, the conversations that I had with later stage um, uh, investors that were trying to do early stage before. It's much more objective. Um, you're not sort of 
looked at as a strategic investment from day one. So, you know, I think that the, the, there's a lot of maturity that has come to um, the, the, the funding environment. And it's not just telecoms, folks like Partech, um, there are all kinds of guys doing really, really interesting things. And then I think we're also starting to see sort of the beginnings of folks who've, um, who have um, exited businesses starting to do seed investments. And that's really, really critical. So I think we have come really far from 10 years ago, no comparison at all. Um, and, you know, I think this is a big bump in the road we've entered right now with COVID. But I still think, but I think... Um, you know, sort of the general secular trend line is a very good one. Okay. That's really interesting. I mean, some of that's really useful. I'd like to actually like dig in a little bit. I mean, I guess the um, first question, you mentioned FinTech and you said, well, is consolidation coming in there? And I'm, I, I'd like to know a little bit about that, but I'm also concerned. I want to ask, have we over-indexed on FinTechs? Um, is there too much energy in that space? Um, should there be, you mentioned healthcare and education not getting as much attention. What's your sense in terms of both investor and operator interest in those kind of sectors? Has there been too little or is it natural? Is maybe FinTech just, it makes sense as a starting point? Yeah, Tommy, I think it's an interesting question. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from a point of view of someone who, um, I'm not privy to the numbers, I'm not privy to the user adoption and what the gross margins of some of these um, firms look like. I know that at several of these firms, so if you look at, um, I mean, the founders in this environment, whether it's Adia or Kechi or, um, or um, Ngozi and Chijoke, these are really savvy people, yeah. really, really smart people. Um, I think the thing that concerns me is, um, um, without knowing too much, is that as I sort of survey the landscape, and I, I got caught in this earlier with e-commerce also, um, the, the reason I think that there might be consolidation is that I'm not sure I observe a, a lot of differentiation between a lot of the models. Um, and so, I, and, you know, the, for, for each of these founders, I've sort of mentioned there are dozens of others. And so when there isn't a lot of differentiation, what ends up happening is that startups battle and compete in the arena of gross margin. So for, for those of us that are not really sort of experienced founders, you know, you've got your revenues and then you've got your cost of goods and then you've got your gross margin. And if you can't really sort of differentiate, what you end up doing is competing on, on you know, it, it, with, with gross profit margin. In trying to acquire customers, you basically neutralize and negate profits. And that's never a good, good thing. And I think that ultimately ends up with some form of consolidation. Yeah. Um, otherwise the industry itself sort of just suffers and, and falls um, in on itself. I don't think we've seen, I mean, I think they're incredibly, when I came into this U lesson opportunity, so I'd, I'd looked at this in 2008, 2009, and I'd sort of been waiting for the, the I, I, if you like, the tools to build something like this to be ready. Okay. Um, and I feel like the tools are ready now, uh, whether that's sort of 4G or smartphones or SD cards that can hold dozens of gigabytes. There are a lot okay. of tools that are ready now that just weren't 10 years ago. They're simply absent. That's right. Um, What's really interesting so, when you talk about that is like the way technology always does that. It's like the iPhone arrived at the moment where there was a hard drive. I know the actually even the iPod. Yeah, where there was, solid the where there was a hard drive, drive that was big enough yes. for the thing to make it sense. You know, That's really exactly. Exactly. So the, exactly, that's how technology works, right? You have these sort of substrates that are built on tools, and then those sub, the, the substrate becomes tools for the next level and the next level. And, you know, an entrepreneur says, wow, all these tools are available. And I look at the healthcare sector, for example, and I look at education, even in sort of subsectors different from what you lesson is doing, and I yeah. see so many opportunities um, that, of course, I haven't dug into. You know, as entrepreneurs, you kind of look at something and you say, oh, this could work or that could work. And then you dig into it. Um, but there's so many sort of challenges and opportunities that are not being addressed. And I, yeah. I do think that the, the overfocus on sort of online lending or payment processing, like there's been a lot of capital and entrepreneurial energy and, and sort of cerebral sort of power that's gone into that sector. And I think it's been to the detriment of many other sectors that could um, benefit from all of those resources. And I think education and healthcare are really, really big ones. Okay. I'm going to get let's, get, let's get specific about sort of like building in this particular environment, just because, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can talk broadly for uh, an hour, I'm sure. Um, so COVID obviously sort of is the monster that aids 2020. Mm -hmm. Nobody saw it coming, really. 
Um, what are the biggest changes you say, like if, how does it change the tech landscape? You know, what are the impacts of this in your, from your perspective? So, um, so I think that there, there are some major impacts. So I'll probably put them in sort of um, four buckets. So three of those buckets I would say are sort of external buckets and then one is internal. Okay. So, so let's kind of, so the four external buckets in my mind would be um, the funding environment, um, uh, the, the uh, purchasing power of customers, which is a derivative of the third bucket, which is macroeconomic conditions. And then the final would be sort of the internal operations of companies. Um, so in terms of the funding environment, I think that you will generally see um, investors across the entire life cycle become much more discerning um, okay. as to, and much more risk averse as to um, what, what they'd be willing to invest in. Yeah. Um, so, but I think that said, I think savvy investors will still, look, there are always opportunities, no matter what's going on in the world. There's always opportunities. Um, so savvy investors will always find those opportunities. So I think you're going to see a, a bit of a pullback in that. I think that's kind of cliche. Everybody's talking about that right now. I think we're entering yeah. sort of a bit of a winter. Um, as to how long that will last, to me, n none of us really know. Yeah. Um, we can use the previous pandemic of 1918, 1919 as a proxy. So that's kind of how I've looked at all of these four buckets, even is using 1918, 1919 as a proxy. Okay. Um, and I would encourage every entrepreneur, it is our job as sort of leaders uh, um, to, to find these analogs as to what happened and what this could mean. And while 1918 and 19, 1919 Spanish flu, as it was called then, is not a perfect proxy because human beings have learned a lot since then. We've got antibiotics and we understand what microbes are and, and viruses and all of these things are now. But they do provide sort of... It. One thing, for example, that that pandemic points to is that this is not going to be a, a short-term event. It's going to roll on and on and on and on and on, um, yeah. even after the quote-unquote lockdowns end. So, you know, I do see sort of the funding environment being dampened um, for me going into early next year. Um, and so I'm looking at my resources from that point of view. I think yeah. the second one really depends, to be completely blunt, on the sector you're operating in. I've talked to, um, you know, there are some businesses that just see where, where this pandemic, as tragic as it is, provides wind um, beneath yeah. your wings. Uh, I think, to be completely frank, that applies to you, Lesson. We, it definitely is wind beneath our wings. I think we're seeing the threshold for a willingness to try um, distance learning or online education drop dramatically. Yeah. And we've, we've definitely seen that in adoption. Um, and I don't think we're going to re return to this baseline. I think this is basically there will be a new normal. And then there are businesses that will be sort of um, midway between the two, um, where some of their customers may not spend as much and then other customers will spend more. I think enterprise solutions um, probably will suffer much more because businesses are just not investing. Um, government is just not investing anymore. So if you're providing an enterprise solution, I think that, that there are some very difficult um, questions you have to ask yourself as to how you manage resources and things like that. And then there are other sectors that just suffer completely, right? Like you don't want to operate cruise lines right now or hotels. Like you just don't want to be doing that, right? I mean, I think my friend Mark Essien um, tweeted yesterday, I haven't yeah. talked to Mark in a very long time, but I, he was very open in, in this tweet, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, where he said, these are tough times for hotels.ng. And yeah. I think behind that um, was an entrepreneur sort of um, coming to terms with the fact that the sector he operates in, of which is marketplace, which is a very valuable marketplace for that sector, um, that, that marketplace is a derivative of the economic activity of that sector. I'd imagine he's feeling a lot of pain right now. Yeah. So... Um, so it really depends on what you're in. So that's the second sector, um, the second bucket. The third bucket, I think, is macroeconomics. Just briefly, before you go into macroeconomics, yeah. um, one question on purchasing power. You've said enterprise, you see a lot of pain for and you see things being difficult. But I mean, yeah. from a purchasing power perspective, and this ties into macroeconomics, um, especially in Africa, our consumers didn't have that much sort of spending power in the first instance. And yeah. so if you're going directly to consumer, isn't this even tougher for you than like for if you're sort of serving an enterprise uh, market? 
No, Tommy, I think, again, it depends. When you look at B2C business models, I think you will generally find that there will be more business models that are resilient than in B2B business models. I mean, a classic case, e-commerce. I mean, corporates across the United States are, are struggling right now, but Amazon is hiring 100,000 workers, right? Yeah. Um, so um, uh, you lesson is B2C. Um, corporates are struggling right now. Um, even we as a corporate are not making the CapEx investments we would be making in HR systems or in ERP systems. Um, instead, we're finding ways to human hack things and to sort of preserve capital. So we're not investing like we would have, even though our top line is doing okay. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, th this is sort of the dynamic that you, you kind of need to be aware of. I think, generally speaking, um, Corporates as sort of organisms will probably um, pull back um, on investment and spend, um, all things being equal, than um, individuals will, than consumers will. Gotcha. Okay. As you go into macroeconomic, I'm going to pull something from the Q&A for your consideration. So speaking about macroeconomic, um, this is specific to Nigeria, but it's also about currency and the devaluation and the impact of that. Okay. So in your conversation yeah. about... The macroeconomic situation could you also sort of like um if you could touch on that as well and also how founders think about that you know or navigate it so that's actually i think um that was actually where i was going so um if you look at so i'm, I'm not an um what you sort of call it a, i'm fascinated with economics but you know i'm fascinated enough to know a little bit about it but i'm by no means kind of a professional but i do know that these are going to be challenging times for economies across the world, especially the oil producers. Um, so if you look at, let, let's just look at a couple of proxies. Right? So um, Europe, for example, the European Union is looking at fiscal deficits, which is basically a measure of how much government is spending versus what it's taking in. Europe is looking at fiscal deficits for 2020 of 7.5%, Tommy. That is compared to, say, um, their Maastricht criteria, or, you know, that kind of, serves as the boundaries under which they operate pres prescribes 1.5 percent so europe is feeling a lot of pain the united states is experiencing record unemployment levels that have not been seen since you know sort of early early parts of the 20th century and the united states is also seeing um fiscal deficits that are approaching sort of um 10 percent um through 2020 projected Funny enough, Nigeria, compared to other oil producers, is actually doing okay in the context of fiscal deficits. They're projecting a fiscal deficit for Nigeria, I think, is the IMF's projections of 6.5%. 6 um, the average for oil producing nations is 7.6%, which is you're spending more than you're taking in. So there's pain all around. The, the particular challenge with Nigeria, and if you look at sort of Africa, and hopefully I'll as we go on, you see more African countries kind of rise up and our tech environment become much more robust. And you see activity in Zambia and Zimbabwe and Gabon, and all these places, you know, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa. Um, and Nigeria is in, in, a, in a very sort of precarious position in particular, because this drop in oil prices um, has a huge impact on government spending, massive impact on government spending. Mm -hmm. And that government spending, as much as we like to think that we kind of sit above the rest of the, and we sit in this sort of tech yeah. um, elysium or heaven, we are connected to the Nigerian economy. That government spending drives everything in Nigeria. It also applies to Ghana and Kenya. Across Africa, all countries are tied. Um, consumer, consumerism is tied to government spending, but it's particularly the case in Ghana. So how would I address it as an entrepreneur? I would borrow from the advice that Obi, the founder of Kobo360, gave me. Very, very, I, I think he put it best, if I can kind of make the advice he gave me just three days ago public. And we were talking about this issue four days ago. And he said, you know, you basically now have to start thinking of yourself as basically this crisis is forcing you lesson, and you've probably kind of seen this, uh, seen me tweet about this, is forcing you lesson to diversify into other geographies faster than we yeah. would otherwise have. There are two forces for why that's happened. The first force is people are saying we want it. So we're seeing consumers in Ghana buying our product without advertising, without any digital spend in that market. But we really haven't done any advertising. 
And we're seeing some spend already happening there. But also, I think it's the responsibility of management to diversify from what will, I think, be uh, what is in Naira that is at great risk. It's almost a certainty that the Naira will be devalued. Yeah. Um, I think Goldman Sachs is calling the Naira, I think, at 540 or 550 oh, at some ah. point early next year. Um, I've talked to a couple of people that say that that's a massive. It may me not get that me. bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if you want to sleep, then I suppose what I'm saying is that you need to get that readership in other markets yeah. going. So I need the Ghanaian CD as a hedge. I need the Kenyan shilling as a hedge. Um, that is literally the, and this was a big challenge that this was effectively the straw that kind of, this was a, a massive blow for Conga because the nature of that business model that I had built before, like lockdowns globally to end really early is, this could get so much worse. If you leave this thing in the wild, it's, it's crazy. And the medicine is, you're right, the medicine is incredibly, incredibly damaging. But yes. the alternative, I don't think people have fully... Oh, it would be catastrophic. Yeah. I've, I've read, so I heard somebody talk about if you adjust for population growth, if you look at the population of the world then versus the yeah. population of the world now, if the same percentage of people died, we'll be looking at 450 million deaths. Yeah. And like I said, back then, we didn't have a Bill Gates that was willing to basically invest in, you know, 10 different vaccine candidates at the same time. We that. didn't have a multilateral institution like the World Health Organization, like you're saying. Yeah. Um, we didn't even, be, we didn't know, we didn't have antibiotics. Yeah. Um, we didn't know about microbes um, and we didn't, yeah. Am I still here? Yeah. Can you still see me? I can still see you. I can still hear you. Okay. So, so we didn't, we didn't have all, so it could get much, much worse. But I do think that, um, I, I do think that this thing is going to be much more painful than we expect. I think, um, um, and I think it will linger longer than we think. And I, I think um, I think it will be particularly challenging for um, for this part of the world um, because there's this dynamic of people having to go out to buy and eat, buy and they basically make income every day. Yeah, that makes lockdowns really really challenging. So anyway, so that's the macroeconomic bucket. You know, it's, you, you need to diversify, and I think oil producing countries in particular are faced with massive challenges. You just saw Angola, for example, just Angola is no longer the three, number three largest economy in sub-Saharan Africa, it's dropped below Kenya. So you're already starting to see this sort of, um, and you're seeing all kinds of proxies, um, whether it's the elimination of um, petrol subsidy, or finally the South African government, if you ask me in my opinion, finally having the courage to listen to Tito Mbweni and say, let South African Airways go into administration. Yeah. We're starting to see Big some deal. of these things happen. Yeah. yeah, it's a massive deal. That thing has been hanging on life support for like a decade or something. So governments are making important choices. Then internally, yes. I'll tell you what I found. The final bucket is um, I think it will force organizations to become much more efficient. So that's what I am seeing internally. Those, I, I would say that our expenses have dropped dramatically because when you gather people together, a lot of efficiency almost arises as a mess. Like, it's like people have to spend money for the sake of busyness um, with a why, you know? So we've seen much more efficiency from a finance point of view. And then I think um, it also um, forces you to think critically about um, who, is, who is indispensable, who is critical. And, you know, you just cannot afford and let me tell you, the consequence of what is going to happen in all of this is we're going to see a lot of um, unemployment. And I'm not saying, I'm not, you know, making light of this. Um, it's, it's a very painful thing. Any founder that is not a sociopath will tell you if they're facing firing even one person, they'll probably lose sleep for yeah. weeks, you know. So um, it, it's, um, we're going to face a lot of that. Um, yeah. So efficiency is the name of the game, um, I think. So these are the different sort of impacts, uh, the, the different buckets I think we're going to be facing over the next year. Okay. Um, thank you. I think that's all incredibly useful. I'm going to jump into a bit of the Q&A and uh, sort of pick some questions from the audience. A little bit curious, uh, I have Neil Adelshu who wants to know a bit about sort of your thoughts on going into the e-commerce space today. Three questions, actually. Raise a pre for someone who's raising a pre-seed fund for an innovative 
fintech startup, who and where would you advise the person to look? And would you be willing to look at his fintech pitch deck or her fintech pitch deck and advise on how to raise a seed fund? I think maybe take the first one of those questions, which is your thoughts on going into e-commerce today and what advice you'd give anyone in that space currently. E-commerce at this point, I, I think, well, I assume the, the person is talking about Nigeria or some other African country. Yes, um, I, I, I think, you know, I'd have to look at, the, there are so many flavors to e-commerce that I'll have to look at the particular model to really kind of judge. But I, you know, I've gotten this question from investors who are looking to invest, like, you know, some of, you know, the, the more respected investors on the, on the continent. Uh, should we look at e-commerce? I, I would generally say if it involves uh, investment in heavy assets, uh, whether that's inventory or um, uh, bikes or vans or things like that, I, I, I'm not sure. I think there's sort of other areas you can get better return for your um, <laughs> capital. Uh, I, I wouldn't suggest it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure um, that, that that would be such a, a, especially not now, I'm not sure that would be such a great sort of sector to put your cash into. Um, in terms of FinTech, um, I mean, you would have to be massively, right, Tommy, this goes back to what we talked about before. You'd have to be highly differentiated from what other people are, do, are doing. Like I said, you've got a few teams that are just incredible first-class teams. And you really yeah. have to give it to that sector. I mean, they're so collaborative and they, they're all friends and, and they compete Actually, I'll say something. I, I yeah. will say something. You meant, when you were talking about it earlier and you mentioned, say, uh, you mentioned uh, um, a few of the different players um, and the personalities in there. I mean, something that did occur to me is that, look, it's not the scorched earth battle that you guys had where it was Conger versus Jumia and everybody must die. Uh, a like, zero-sum game, yeah. You know, completely zero-sum game. You don't really see as much of that in this sector. No, as, you don't. Um, I, think. Hmm. Um, I think that's been really interesting. I mean, I think in, say, like, logistics, I think, you know, Kobo and um, uh, what's the Kenyan? Uh, lorry Kony, systems. Uh, lorry systems. I mean, yeah. I've been sort of getting pretty punchy. Um, but I, I don't think any of that really, like, compares with sort of how sort of, like, zero sum the, the the last generation of battles was yeah no and it's interesting i wonder what drove that dynamic i think there were a lot of personal factors in there <laughs> um, but, <laughs> well uh jason and joke has done a bit of writing about this <laughs> yeah i don't know yeah, if you read any of it <laughs> uh, he, yeah, he, like, he likes to tell that story yeah. um so yeah um no, but I think it's also the nature of e-commerce to be honest inventory e-commerce i think you've seen a similar dynamic in many markets um and uh, it, it is very much sort of a zero-sum game because ultimately the competition is fought in, in the battle of gross margins. Yeah. And, uh, sorry, in the arena of gross margins. And, and then who can sort of raise more money. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, maybe it's not those dynamics don't ex exist so much in finance. Or maybe the scope is because the truth is, the truth is that Africa is hugely deficient in, in, in the in the sense of financial services. So it's possible that for these guys, the market is just so large um, that, um, that they don't really sort of have to go head to head for a very, very long time. So, um, so back to the, um, the individual's question, I, I think if you're, I mean, if you're a payment processor or you know, you're sort of doing lending um, that is sort of pillared by machine learning or you know, AI or any of those things, I think, um, uh, I, I wouldn't be too enthusiastic, but that said, I think that there are other sort of um, second degree services that may be interesting. I think insurance, for example, is you know, there's some is is a subsector that we need to see some innovation in. Um, I don't think we've seen enough in that. So there, there are all kinds of subsectors, but um, I, I wouldn't be it wouldn't be my first sort of bet. Gotcha. Okay. Um, someone's asking a question around the tools that you use to build deal day. And I think I'm going to expand that question and just say, um, what was in your toolkit when you were building deal day, when you were building Conga, and what's changed in the toolkit that you're using to build, um, you lesson now, um, what effects did those tools have then? 
And what effect are you expecting you know, as a founder, as a leader? What are the tools that you're using today and what effects do you expect them to have on the business? So, um, so I think, you know, sort of, so deal day was, um, was super early stage e-commerce. I think we'll all agree, um, for yeah. Nigeria, it was super simple. Um, it was browser based. Um, I think we ended up building an Android app at some point, but it's largely browser based. It was one SKU sort of dominating the page. As SKU is like an item you're selling, a storekeeping unit. Um, so it was a really simple, I mean, in sort of the, if you look at sort of these e-commerce um, businesses as kind of, even up until now, as organisms, deal day was like a jellyfish or, or an earthworm. It was really simple business model. Um, yeah. um, the challenge with it was that um, for every time you wanted to run an SKU, you had to go and originate that transaction again. Um, as opposed to, you know, when you sell an iPhone, you can sell many units against it. Um, by the time we got to Conga, smartphone penetration was much deeper. Um, the tools to be able to calculate your um, cost of um, acquiring a user had gotten much more robust. Um, Google has started providing many of those services for free. Um, the payment services had started to emerge. Um, but even in spite of the payment, so a lot of these tools, Tommy, actually sort of exo they're outside, they're exogenous. They didn't really have a lot to do with um, sorry, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're in Dodge, they're within the organization and within my own mind, much more than the tools outside. So um, the environment had, has really changed by Congas at the time of Congas. So something like 5% of our payments by the time we got to Conga were payments that were made online, 6%. I think we got it up to about 15%. Uh, but what we're seeing in U Lesson, for instance, is the trust in payments. The payment services providers, Flutterway, Paystack, I mean, these guys are just doing a fantastic job right now. Um, the change of the attitude of the consumer. These ha basically have an, I can tell you that basically the people that will subscribe on Lesson and whip out their cards and pay is yeah. many times more now, percentage-wise. Mm -hmm. You know, it's as much as 50%. So the environment has changed completely. Um, the, the, um, the consumer is much more trusting of engaging with online brands. The um, tools to, to basically calculate your cost of um, acquiring a customer are so much more robust now. There is just so many levels of them. You know, you've got Google, of course, you've got the usual suspects, you've got Facebook and its tools, but you've got mixed panel now, you've got adjust, you've got so many of these sort of second generation tools that can let you do attribution of your sales. And this is so, and for me as an entrepreneur, this is something I didn't appreciate, I think, at deal day, and maybe not even so much as at Conga, but I'm laser focused on it now, um, is monitoring cost of user acquisition and optimizing for that and attributing where are those sales coming from. Is Facebook converting more than Google? Is telesales, you know, with all these channels, uh, you know, where, where, where sort of, how does the river flow? Where does it flow in? Where does it, where does it flow out? Um, and um, in, the, in the last month, I mean, we've not waited to month six or month 12 or our series A to start to do this. I think from day one, we have a team that is like hyper-focused and some really talented people that I are hyper-focused on doing this. As a, media, as a media business, something that's a bit painful for us, um, but probably a really good thing for you is that I suspect your cost of our, customer acquisition has just gone down dramatically. Because yes. this is forcing everyone. What's interesting for us as a media business <laughs> is that it means you don't need to advertise as much because people are just like, they're looking for you anyway. I mean, you should advertise <laughs> with us anyway because we'll put you in front of the customers. But um, yeah. it is a really interesting dynamic. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think in the long term, you guys win anyway. I think that's a really interesting conversation. I would love to. I mean, you could just, you could have an hour's conversation about that <laughs> at any rate. But um, in the long term, the media owner wins. I mean, I think this is just sort of a blip for you guys. Um, but, I hope you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think so. I think the media... So, I mean, at the end of the day, it all comes down to creativity. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, whether you're a media owner or somebody that's buying media, for yeah. me, I'm basically trying to... The true worth of our services, I think, as you lesson, um, will be when we start seeing 
um, when we see our retention rates, right? I mean, our marquee service that most gotcha. Nigerians are subscribing for is this one-term service where you can subscribe right now for maths, physics, chemistry, biology, full curriculum, if you allow me to sell for a second. Um, <laughs> all the topics covering your bill afterwards. <laughs> richest, like, you know, content ever, all of that. Um, and uh, the, the subscription ends in August, and we'll start to see um, you know, how our users return. Yeah. But I think the signs have been really good because I can tell you I've never built a business where co co consumers call in after they paid to say thank you. Like, this is amazing, you know? So, and, and this doesn't happen once in a while. This is literally several instances a day. That's fantastic. So, yeah, yeah, it's really, really kind of been a good sign. And I think the COVID-19 situation has kind of um, been a big, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really kind of made people aware of the value that services like this can provide. Let me just, I'll move on to a question from Osage Alonge. Hi, Osage. Um, and it kind of talks, uh, touches on sort of cost of uh, acquisition. Um, basically, his question is about what's your approach to marketing a digital product? knowing that a large part of your potential TA, you have to onboard onto the technology for the first time. And I, I mean, I can see that with you, Lesson, you've tried to simplify the product. Um, but I think it's a big sort of like concern with new products in this market is um, your cost of acquisition goes up because there's so much consumer education you have to do. So what's your thinking yes. about that today? Yeah, no, so I think, um, I think that's absolutely true. You said the cost of a TA, no, cost of acquisition, yeah. seeing that you have to, um, well, the target audience, that's what TA is. Oh, the target uh, audience. Okay. Seeing that's that you have to educate the target audience, you know, all yeah. before they actually, like, start using the product. I mean, and so many Yeah, no, no, so you you know, know, I think you absolutely have to. Yeah. But I think you have really, the truth is you have really good channels. Um, okay. Google and Facebook and the Facebook properties, I think, provide really good channels. Um, okay. um, but that is not sufficient in our market. I'll get to that in a second. Um, if you look at the cost of acquiring a, a user, sort of, uh, sort of an app install, if you like, Nigeria is still doing pretty well. And it's not going to be like this forever. I mean, we are still at sort of the 28, 29, 30, 35 US cents range for most African countries. In India, yeah. that number is substantially more. In the United States, I mean, if you look at, say, ride hailing apps, that number can be in the 5 to $10 range, which is just, you know, really painful. Um, so, you know, there are channels available for digital acquisition that I think need to be explored. But that said, um, you can't discount TV as a founder. Um, the, yeah, it's, it's still super critical. I mean, we're two decades into the 21st century and TV, meaning free terrestrial or pay TV, is still so important. Um, in our first week of... Um, you know, selling um, you less. And we have a big telesales operation that is a substantial part of our sales. But, you know, the majority is actually sort of people just buying on their own. And we would call people, and I participated in this with the team. And there was very much a hesitation and sometimes like, there's no way something valuable can cost this much. We literally saw those concerns and those hesitations fade away as we started our TV campaigns. So TV, yeah, TV still gives you um, a, uh, this halo of legitimacy or credibility or whatever. But that yeah. said, like, like um, the question asker mentioned, it's, it, TV is expensive. Um, it's not as expensive as the US, thankfully, but it is still pretty pricey in this part of the world. Radio? What are your thoughts on radio? Um, I think for... Uh, yeah, no, I think for certain brands, um, it works. Um, I've never been a big fan. I'm a big sort of, I, I like sort of the visual. I think with visuals, you can communicate much more than you can with words. Yeah. Um, I think human beings are inherently sort of visual animals. So I've not sort of um, tended to radio. I think radio placing, getting the ratings, first of all, I think are challenging. Placing the ads and monitoring the placements is difficult. I think communicating the message is difficult. You can't um, um, sort of put across the value of a brand. I think radio really works for um, sort of the um, lower B and C segments, sort of the lower yeah. income sort of segments of population. Yeah. Um, 
And I think, you know, and there are also some young people that have actually relied on a slightly more educated, slightly wealthier audience, actually. Yeah, exactly. And I think, um, I think that, you know, radio is really valuable, I think, in high traffic. So radio remains very valuable in Lagos, paradoxically, even though Lagos is high income because of the traffic situation in Lagos. Um, so wealthier people will still listen to radio. Gotcha. Um, but I think the rest of uh, Nigeria, and I, th I would suspect in many African countries where the traffic situation is not as acute as Lagos, that radio would not be, it's just, it's, it's, it wouldn't be as valuable to brands in sort of the... Okay, um, we've just got about 10 minutes more, so I'm going to, I'll jump into a couple more questions. Um, we do need to answer them with good lightning. Um, so there are two questions, flip side. One is about sort of, Look, how do you find customers? You know, how do you find investment, given the current situation in the next six months? Um, and then the reverse of that is, how do you manage your cash flow? Your legal is still asking for money. Your accounting is still looking for money. Those kind of critical services are still looking for money. Um, you're a bootstrapping founder. What do you do to manage your costs? So um, finding customers and investment in this time, and then cost management thinking about that. Strategies, biggest strategies. I mean, I think some of these are obvious, but... Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, I think, yeah, it, again, it depends on the sector you're in. I think you can't, I think TV is really, so if we talk about the media um, channels, I think online and TV are the, the champions right now. Um, okay. For obvious reasons, like you said, I mean, I don't think radio makes a lot of sense right now. Yeah. Um, because people are just not out and about as much and everybody's sort of glued to the TVs right now. Um, I think social media is super critical. Um, but I think you can't discount, um, um, you can't discount um, just creating something that people want. In terms of managing your cash flow, um, and um, you know, I think there's, there's a tendency we have as entrepreneurs to not want to take a hard look at the figures and to not sort of run the worst case scenario in our minds. Um, I generally, a very healthy approach, I can sort of try and be stoic and detach myself from it, but I, I try to think of the worst case scenario and then plan for that scenario. And, yeah. and for me, um, that means sort of maximizing one way, of course. Um, and so that means having a, a, a um, uh, having your finger on on uh, on your expenses and your revenues, and being yeah. very realistic, not overly optimistic. You can be optimistic um, in in a qualitative way, where you're sort of you know you believe you're you're going to take over the world. But I think when you're actually running the Excel model, I think you have to be um, you have to be realistic and even think about the worst case scenario. Um, to be honest with you, I think, you know, we, we all kind of know what we have to do. I'm not sure that there are sort of technical things you have to do. I think there are traits we have to exhibit. Um, this period calls for leaders to be incredibly decisive um, and um, to basically think about what is priority. Um, okay. Literally what, you, what the business will need um, to survive, what it needs to sell. Um, not just now, but maybe even to the future. So you can keep investing, but it's all about thinking about what is priority. Um, yeah. And everything else just needs to fall away. You need to be ruthless yeah. and decisive about that. Um, um, the, that would be the advice I would, I would give. And run your numbers. I mean, you really, I do, times like this, you need to um, be realistic about sort of running your numbers, have, a sense of every expense, every cash outflow, ev everything, and, um, and then um, make the hard decisions that it would take to, while assuming whatever learnings you can get from, say, previous pandemics, or assuming, for me, I've just assumed that this thing's gonna roll on for a year. Um, so yeah. I'm just assuming that, you know, I have to survive on what I have for a year. Um, so gotcha. you need to just make those hard decisions. Yeah. Um, before you get into the flip side of that question, which is about accessing customers and perhaps investment, um, which is a dubious thing as, as well, I've got a bunch of people in the chat room asking you if we can extend this conversation. We're supposed to end at noon, um, but depending on you, we could keep it going for an extra 10, 15, 20 minutes. 
What, what works for you, if anything? Uh, 10,000 Naira per participant per minute works. <laughs> Guys in the chat room, <laughs> no, you all have the 10,000 to send to him. <laughs> We can, we can See, do why are you laughing now? Send the money. <laughs> <laughs> you you're always a businessman, I assume. <laughs> one, uh, one call a day person, you know, ask for account number. So we can send the money. Yeah, I saw it just now. Uh, um, what do you think? Uh, yeah, how much time do you have? Going for, for another five, ten minutes. I think that's fine. Yeah, and let's see another 10 minutes um, okay, as a hard right. stop. That's yeah, right. 10 minutes or so. Okay. Um, yes, okay. He's waved it. Thank you, Sunday, but you do. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So, I mean, thinking about, so you're, you're still, if you're a business, you're still building consumers. You're still building audience. You're still trying to grow your audience. Um, and I mean, for some of our businesses, some businesses came into, the, into this crisis in growth mode. You know, still trying to figure out their finances, still trying to figure out their audience. Um, what do you do now? How do you, how do you continue that growth given these conditions? Um, I know you said investment is very sector specific. So I, I you know, so, um, you know, uh, what's the gene? And customer spend is sector specific dollars. too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so some people have just raised $15 million, but they're in health. They're, you know, in gene technology. It's the right time for them. Um, exactly. But um, if you are in a growth phase, if you are still looking for customers and trying to build audience, what's the play right now? Um, you know, and you're not in education and health, you know, so you're not like perfectly situated for the for the moment. Or e-commerce, you know, um, where this is your chance to to shine. What do you do? Yeah. So I think let's take the other extreme, and because most people will fall somewhere in the middle. So let's say you've, um, you have some resources, you were um, doing okay before all of this. Look, I mean, I think the, the thing to understand through all of this is that this, we business leaders and I think political leaders are even more guilty of this to be fair to us. We, we are still kind of thinking of this event as something that has some precedence in the past sort of 10, 20 years. This is, in, this is incredibly extraordinary. If, if you can even, if that is a term. It's, it's highly extraordinary. So if, if you are, I think, you know, if you were a business that would say highly, if you were, say, deep in the hospitality sector, you basically have to think about this, um, I think, as a period of hibernation. That would be the other extreme. Preserve your resources, preserve your capital, let the entity survive. When things start to wake up, then you might come back um, to attack the space. And I think most businesses fall between those two spaces. Um, you, you have to think about um, whether your, your business is resilient or even benefits from something like this. If it's not resilient to it, then I think you go into hibernation mode. Um, I think there's a reason that, you know, it, there, are, there are many animals in... Um, you know, so over the course of evolution that I've managed to, I think of many times like business opportunities and the business space as sort of an ecosystem of sort of animals that are evolving in a Darwinistic way and competing and all of this. And the animals that have figured out that when times are tough, you basically just freeze. And, you know, you stop spending, you preserve your resources and you wait for this period to be over. These are the hard, decisive decisions that we need to take. That is certainly what I would do. I mean, it's not like we planned you know, when we were building an online education business, we started building this thing in, you know, a long time ago. And we yeah. didn't know this was coming. But if I were in a sector, um, th then I would be, to be honest with you, I would be facing the incredibly painful and difficult decision of writing my team and saying, look, we can't um, keep um, this headcount right now. As soon as this thing ends, nobody would be more pleased than I than to write you and say, come back to work. But we, we need to basically stop right now. The expense line cannot continue. The revenue line is, is basically evaporated. Now, hopefully, most businesses are not at that extreme. Most are sort of in the middle somewhere. If you're in the middle somewhere and you have some customers that are more resilient in their spending um, to um, the events of the past sort of four months than others, then you want to um, turn your 
investment, your attention as much as possible to, to that segment. Yeah. Again, the same way that even you lesson, for example, because the ground, the macroeconomic ground under our feet is kind of falling, if you think of devaluation like that and shaky, and we're looking at Ghana and Kenya more and more, these are decisions you have to take. And again, this comes back to the decisiveness. You have to understand your customers very clearly and then make very, you know, I, I don't think this is not the time to kind of be delusional um, and not be decisive. I think you have to do whatever it takes to survive um, this period, um, whatever this period means. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I've got a question about just, you know, so you've mentioned FinTech, education, health. What do you think about energy? Uh, they asked specifically about the distributed energy sector. But what do you think about sort of the energy sector overall, I suppose? No, I think it's, I think it's really interesting, actually. Um, I think there are a couple of um, startups that are doing really interesting things. I think the general trend will be, um, it's very clear that the general um, trend across the world will be more towards sort of distributed energy that negates this sort of issue around transmission and distribution companies, where you can generate power in a very local context and then consume in that sort of, sort of hyper local context. There are a couple of business models that have emerged on, um, even in Nigeria that are, um, that are proving that this can work. Yeah. Um, now you always need sort of base load power. So coal and, um, you know, large scale hydro will always need to be there for heavy industry and all of these things. But I think, I suspect that you're going to see an acceleration of the adoption of distributed um, provision of power. Um, so generation and consumption in a hyper local context in, in, in um, across Africa. I think this is going to be a very big thing. It's definitely a trend I would invest in. Um, and in fact, there's an investment I'm kind of looking at right now um, around this space that has very interesting economics of um, generating um, electricity using solar power and then distributing um, lo locally um, yeah. for consumption. Now, that said, the fall of oil prices, um, strangely, is a headwind for that for um, alternative and, and this sort of model of energy. Yeah. Um, because what you really want is oil prices to be incredibly high and coal prices to be super high. And then that makes these alternatives attractive. Look really attractive. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a bit of a headwind now that we're seeing for sort of the, you know, electric car companies and these alternatives. Sort I mean, of, you know what's um, interesting about that um, is that distribution is actually the, the key because whether you're using solar or you're using gas, whatever it is, I think the key thing yeah. that we need to do, particularly in Nigeria and in a lot of places across the continent, is, is that captive distribution. It's being able to generate power for an industrial area and being able yes. to guarantee over an industrial area or a residential estate that you will have 24 hour power so this place can work. You can build a yes. business in this area that works. And yes. I think the smart play and the, the smarter, smartest players will be those who have some flexibility. It's like, we'll use solar and we'll do, you know, some kind of general investment in this. But, you know, if gas gets cheap enough, you know, we can switch to gas as our primary sort of like source. I know like sometimes those are like two heavy investments in two different directions. But yeah, and I, I think, I think even an extension of what you're saying is related. Yeah. I think an extension of what you're saying is that, you know, and I mean, this is sort of, I think, a shortcoming of sort of government investment and spend, I think, in Nigeria, certainly many parts of Africa, but I think definitely in Nigeria, is I still don't understand, maybe somebody can explain this to me um, someday, why the power, in, in the, when you're talking about sort of heavy industry and having this sort of um, base, base load sort of, you know, power in sort of thousands of megawatts, why, or the hundreds of megawatts, why industry why power has to be taken to industry so you know i think the opportunities are there for basing industry around the source um much more than transmitting power whether it's in a you know form of gas pipelines or um you know um, power lines so um so i you know i think that there's a mix of these things we, we, we will probably see and this actually feeds into the same trend um of this investment i'm looking at the investment is here it's in the middle belt of nigeria which is where i am right now and um, um, this company basically um, installs, um, you know, dozens of kilowatts of electricity in a village and, um, 
and then basically runs a micro distribution line under a very complex regulation, but does it under regulatory oversight into the village and then charges multiples of the tariff of what um, the utility charges. And the villagers are willing to pay. Like they, they're willing to pay. They pay the multiples. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of this sort of thing um, um, going forward. Not just only, not only in the residential sort of segment of electricity consumption, but also in the um, industrial um, uh, segment. Question. Um, and it talks about, there's talk of a new normal post-pandemic. Um, what's your take on what this new normal is in the informal sector? So you're not looking at 6 million people going unemployed like in the US because they were already unemployed or they were already very loosely employed um, in, in the informal economy. So, I mean, I guess the question is, you know, how, how, do you, how does this affect, you know, what changes for us, you know? Um, well, us, us, uh, what, what um, you she referred to this as, as this being the black swan of black swan events. <laughs> I, mean, I think like this is like so um, out of left field. And I think the situation is so turbulent that I, I, I'm not sure um, where we end up on the other side of this, to be honest. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer your question in a different way, but I think um, this question is going to test the um, credibility, the legitimacy of the Nigerian governments, especially the federal government, mm. in a way that it's never been tested before. I agree. Um, I, I would argue that the test, this test will approach the test of the Civil War. Um, yeah. The, the, um, and that's not necessarily tomorrow. That might be in six months. No. I might be in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think this thing is going to roll on for a while. We're going to pay back, we're about to pay back for a lot of the things we've done wrong. And I am not a partisan politician. I, I'm not, you know, but when yeah, I say I um, government, this is just yeah, this is long term government in the last... longest term sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're paying back for a lack of investment in healthcare. We're going to pay back for a di distrust between the people of Nigeria and the government of Nigeria. Um, we're, we're going to pay back for the fact that a lot of our people live day to day and what that means for um, the implementation of just things that Germany or other countries would take for granted, the, the tactics for dealing with you know, these lockdowns. Um, we're going to pay back. A lot of these, I think, debts will come due um, and we'll pay for them. Um, in terms of new normal, the internet has been this like force for, on the one hand, um, it's been a force for libertarianism, you know, yeah. strengthening of the power of the individual, more power going to the individual. But also, um, paradoxically, it's also been a power for authoritarianism. Uh, if you see what China is doing and some of the tactics they're implementing in dealing with this pandemic, I mean, it's just incredible. And you can't argue with some of these tactics. Um, you know, for example, I believe like everybody has like some kind of app on their phone now that with a color code of green, yellow, and red or something. Yeah. And if your if your app says you're green, then you're fine. You haven't been exposed to the virus. Um, if if you've been near somebody um, using geolocation and that person was a red, then you become a red or something like this. So, yeah, but the, yeah. yeah, and, and this has huge implications. Like building that for the rest of the world. Yeah, exactly. And this has huge implications for privacy on the authoritarian front. Um, so I think at the other side of this um, pandemic, we're going to see people willingly give up privacy much more. Um, I think it wouldn't be so much of a debate anymore. Um, so I think, there's um, gonna be, I think there's already plenty of pushback globally, and there's going to be more. Um, I yes. think the pushback will actually get. Um, more oh, you think there will be more pushback against sort of the seeding of privacy? Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of questions. There's going to be a lot of aggressive sort of like pushback against it. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, that's another one of those conversations we could probably spend an entire evening over dinner talking about. I actually have the opposite view. I think people will more willingly give away some of these rights.
um, to allow us to manage things like this better in the future. Um, but you know, you, you never know. Maybe, maybe you know. It, it, but I, I also I'm think that we're going to see. Where I, I, I'm with you on the fact that look, yes, I mean, it's like we're also living in our houses in Lagos and in a few states right now. So clearly, people are giving up, and I mean, across the world, people are sitting in our homes and not going to work. But I mean, if you look at the U.S., you can see people actually like going out and protesting in, um, I think, Wisconsin yesterday or Michigan yesterday yes. people going out to protest being kept in their homes and those guys it doesn't even start it those guys are those guys are being hit really really hard in some states and the states that haven't been hit are already seeing protests you know um you would think they'd be a bit smarter than that but they're already protesting in another month people are going to argue that and i mean this is in a wealthy society um here in lagos you know you're already seeing some of the protests this stuff will only pick up steam and i think when you talk about sort of the the push against the legitimacy of our government or the things that we haven't done, I think that's where you're going to see that pushback coming is people just literally saying, you can't tell me what to do because you're not providing for me. You can't tell me what to do because actually you're not that legitimate as a government. You know, yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think you're going to find that on a global basis. And there are a few sort of like uh, countries that have trust. You know, you look at the Scandinavian countries. And yeah, the yeah, very high trust. Yeah. Well, but I mean, there are Western countries like the US or the UK where there's not that much trust between, and then in developing countries like ours, there is no trust. And so I think it'll be very hard over the long, tough period. I mean, over six months, over a year, over 18 months to yes. like maintain those measures without seeing sort of really strong pushback. If you're China, I mean, China is not afraid to use force. China doesn't care what the ex external yeah. is about them. <laughs> You know, so they'll do what they'll but, do. But exactly, exactly. So, but this is my point, and this is why they've yeah. been so effective at yeah. managing the crisis. Yeah. yeah. Because they are profoundly authoritarian, and they, yeah. there's the, the whole notion of Chinese, Chinese privacy is an oxymoron. So, yeah. and this, this I think is deeply connected with why they've so effectively managed this. Yes, but I don't think many other countries have the power to do that in the same way. Yeah. We've got to bring this conversation to a close. I'm going to do one last question. Uh, one, actually, there are three questions that I'm just going to tie together. Um, and they're all on education, why you started U Lessons, um, what you see as the future of the sector. So this is me giving you one final chance to sell your market uh, <laughs> before we go. But I mean, the questions are, you know, what was the motiva motivation for going into ed tech? You know, like what made you do you listen specifically. Um, what makes you optimistic about the future of education tech, ed tech in Nigeria? Um, yeah. So I think okay. if you if you answer that as a compound questions uh, as a compound question, or well, one last thing, how do you see schools? Are they competitors or are they complementary? Um, and are you seeing users from low income segments, or is this strictly a high income segment play? So all about you listen. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I, I, I've always been super. So I am basically two generations removed from, um, you know, an agrarian um, society in the village in Southern Plateau, like on the banks of the Benue, basically. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound cliche, but, you know, the only reason I think sort of my family or clan or whatever has done relatively well is because of education. We always valued it. And I, I, you know, so there was always this um, importance that was described to education, I think, um, growing up. And then I also think sort of professionally, the happiest moments I've had is when I'm standing in front of a whiteboard or standing in front of a blackboard and sharing knowledge or gaining knowledge. I really, really enjoy this. So the time between Conga and now, for instance, I took the sabbatical where I went to teach at the University of Cape Town. No, I'm sorry, at the University of Stellenbosch in Cape Town. And that was an incredibly fulfilling experience. So I've always loved um, doing this. Like I said, I tried to do this in 2008, but the tools were just not ready. For me, I think that education represents the most profound opportunity to, um, to do good and do well um, on this continent. I think it is at the root of pretty much all of our challenges. Um, 
And so I think, I think the opportunity is, is massive, not just for you, Lesson, but I hope for dozens of companies that will also enter into the space. Literally massive. Um, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people that, can, that, um, that cannot be educated any other way. You know, one, one founder and CEO that I have a lot of respect for, and I think many of us have a lot of respect for, is Jeff Bezos of Amazon. And there's this one interview where he talks about at the early days of Amazon when they, start, they started selling books. And the largest bookstore in, in the United States, I think, was a flagship of Barnes & Nobles, probably in New York or something, and could only carry 100,000 titles or something like that. And at any time um, at, back then, there were, you know, millions of titles in print. So there was literally no way within the physical constraints of the existing system that you could sell books using a bookstore. I think you see a similar thing in education right now. It's not that African countries are not spending on education if you look at it in terms of percentage of GDP or percentage of government spending. They're actually outperforming the West. But it's just that we are so poor and the, the population that needs to be education is so, that needs to be educated is so large that there is no way, it's, it's literally impossible to me for us to educate people using the brick and mortar model of education. It will not happen. We must use digital tools and technology. And those will come through a whole range of ways. They pre-recorded a synchronous model that ULESIN is doing now. And as we look to the future, the synchronous live model. So this conversation we're having right now is a synchronous live model. This is the model we're looking to in the future. And we're going to combine all of these things. And it's the only way, I think, that we will be able to educate the hundreds of millions of people that need to be educated. And this doesn't even add the overhang of adults that, um, that have not received an education that want to be educated. You know, we like to say in your lesson that we're going to make it such that learning under a tree is not something that is bad anymore. Like if you have the smartphone, if I can take the best teacher, somebody who studied at Imperial College or IFE, and take this incredibly talented individual and use digital technologies to leverage his talent and push him to, again, my village in Plateau South, then learning under a tree is not such a bad thing. This is, this is our vision. As to who is, who is buying your lesson, it's literally everyone. It's high income um, individuals. I mean, we've seen, you know, I don't want to name corporates, but you know, you see the emails of people that sign up when they pay. I mean, these are marquee companies. These are, you know, management consulting firms and their employees in Nigeria are oil companies. This is NNPC employees. But it's also people in, you know, outside of Kaduna City, in southern Kaduna, that are looking for um, solutions for their kids because there are no alternatives. So it literally cuts across the entire strata. It's kids who can afford 5K themselves, so they paid themselves. It's kids who are telling their parents, pay for me. Um, it's adults who are saying, I want to get into the civil service and I need my work, so I'm going to pay for this because I'm too embarrassed to go sit in school. So it's literally everyone that is, um, and, and that's precisely how for the future, is to take every tool available, whether that is the fact that SD cards can now fit the entire senior secondary school curriculum. Think about how powerful that is to me. This wasn't the case even five years ago. You know, SS1, SS2, SS3, maths, physics, chemistry, biology, whether you're talking karyotic cells or hydrocarbons, we've taken all of that and fit it onto one SD card and we can distribute that everywhere securely. And then in future, there will be tools that would allow us to take a talent sitting in Lagos or in Joss and push that talent out to literally everywhere, Kigali, Uganda, like literally everywhere as people study for their GCSEs. This is our vision. And then in the far future, in seven, 10 years, I'm sure, you know, you know, I'm somebody that kind of has to restrain myself from just kind of thinking too far about, but there are tools that are coming on the horizon that are very exciting, augmented reality and all of these things that I believe will have a huge role to play, but that's deep into the future. Um, in the short term, I think that there are so many tools that we can use to improve the learning experience. Schools are not our competition at all. Schools are buying this. Um, schools are guiding us on where to go. We have an Android product right now. The next um, product that our team is working on, so September is going to be a big month for you, Lesson. We're releasing both our JSS library and our Windows product. And our drive towards that Windows product was driven by schools. Schools were the ones saying, we need this on Windows. So they're not our competition at all. They're actually a, a very important customer for us. Fantastic. Sam, I'm going to pull this to an end. 
It's been absolutely fascinating. I have 40 questions in the Q&A. So in truth, we could probably go for another two hours if we attempted to answer it all. For the people in the audience, um, I apologize that we can't take all of your questions, but um, Sim has to actually go and run um, a startup. And you know how hard that is because a lot of you work in startups. Um, thank you so, so much for joining us, Sim. I think this has been really fascinating. It's been really, really interesting. Uh, My pleasure. For the people in the audience, our next session is next week, Friday. We're uh, interviewing Egosa Ehosa, a Gray of OVC, and he's going to talk about sort of the, the investment perspective on the current period. Um, this is the first of these sessions, but we're actually looking forward to doing a ton more of them with a range of really, really interesting speakers and experienced sort of operators, investors, regulators, people who matter in this space. So please keep an eye out for us. The conversation continues on techcabal.com, uh, where we publish every day some of the most interesting writing about the tech industry in Africa. Um, you should sign up for our newsletter if you don't already get it. Um, it's one of the best wrap-ups of technology news on the continent. And we're actually doing a new newsletter that comes out every Sunday um, about specifically about the impact of COVID-19 on the African tech ecosystem. So you should sign up for that as well if you are not already signed up. Um, this interview was recorded and we will put it out um, shortly. The team will send an email with details as to when it's going to apply. But thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Sim. Have a wonderful day. We look forward to all the amazing things with you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Tommy. Take care now. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.